Hi y'all, I'm Allison. Today we're going to proceed to the third stop in our Start and Stop Buddy Read of the Moonstone. So you had an option. You can either be reading ahead of me and just kind of kick back and see what I think of it as I make my way to our next stop, or you can actually read along with me. So if you have read ahead, you should already be at the 61% mark and have come across our magical paragraph, which was, I have every reason to believe, I answered, that one of them had an interview with me dot 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 now if you are joining me I'm gonna be pausing the video and reading along as I comment and speculate my way through then you should be 40% of the way into the book and have reached our last stopping point which was in the second place proceeded the sergeant you will hear of the three Indians again so that's where you are you can read with me you've read ahead you're good to go Grab something to drink and kick back and we'll dive in this together. Now, and normally I would have a little group consensus to share with y'all, let you know how everybody else is feeling about the book to this point. But this has been such a, a, a logistical nightmare for me and that I am jumping the gun. Part two hasn't been up that long, so there's not really been time for y'all to respond and let me know what you think so far. And I'm not going to chance it. I'm just going to jump in and proceed to our next one. I, I will share a little bit more about my Moonstone curse. It's continuing. I don't know if you've been keeping up with everything that's been happening. But when I was editing Stop 2, this would have been on Tuesday. First thing in the morning, I wake up. There's one the fake plant that's sitting on the mantle in the living room. It's on the floor. So I'm like, why? And one of the cats went to the bathroom on my mantle. He pooped up there. Or she did. And actually, if one of my cat owners, if your pets start going to the bathroom outside of the litter box, provided that your litter box is clean, then it's actually a sign of stress. They're, they're trying to tell you something. And Joey has been very stressed out. Finley is constantly bothering her. And the kitten is just throwing her over the edge. So I had to make an appointment for Joey. We'll be taking her in on Tuesday. I think she's going to have to go on the anxiety meds too. It's just ridiculous. But I, I don't want the poor cat sick. And they always fight. And I'm tired of it. <laughs> and then we decided to have pizza in the afternoon. I went to pick that up. And I thought, I'll use my credit card. Get the cash back reward things for it. And my card was, they couldn't use it because I had a fraud alert on it. So I had to come home and deal with that. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? It's one thing after another. It's been crazy. And I'm writing at half the normal speed that I normally do. I'm ending up with tons of footage and it's taking me ages to get these edited. I, I thought part two was going to go up on time. I was running really good. And then all of these things kept coming out of left field and I was still editing until midnight last night for that video to go up this morning so I, i'm jumping the gun a little and i i am not going to talk as much today because we gotta get through this book all right let's go settle into my little corner over here and see how far i can get because i'm also waiting for the contractor he's supposed to be here this afternoon we're going on four o'clock i haven't heard anything so I'm trying to get some bids to get my bathroom fixed from the last video. It's so much fun. Okay, all of that aside, let's just dive into Victorian London and I find out what is going and find out what's going on with our new moonstone next. Uh, I'm kind of sad that we appear to be getting close to the end of Betteridge's portion of the book, but hopefully our next character will be just as entertaining. Let's go find out though. Okay, let me see if I can remember where we were. Uh, Rachel had taken off to some other hall. We got Jack right here. <laughs> say, say hello to Jack. He and her mother went, followed her to see how she would react to the news of Rosanna's death. We know that Cuff thinks Rachel is the one responsible for the diamond theft or missing and that she's planning to sell it using Rosanna as our fence to cover a debts. So, and I, I still maintain that it's somebody else's debts and I think it might be Franklin's. 
So we have some answers, whether they're right or not, we don't know. Okay, I adjusted the camera so you can see what Jack is up to, because I have a feeling he's going to get a little feisty. He just woke up from a nap after eating his lunch. So, he's attacking the microphone. No! <laughs> Finley's on the floor behind the camera. Hopefully he'll distract him. Cuff thinks that the three Indians are still going to be involved, and he gave the name of the moneylender in London that I guess is who Miss Rachel owes. So maybe I was wrong. And we'll see if he was right, if all of these names are going to come back up. Okay, so apparently we're just going to be with Betteridge for the next week in the book. And then it's going to turn over to somebody else, as we already know, because our next stop is in the second narrative. Jack was attacking my knee, and his little claws are quite sharp. So I tossed down a ball with a bell in it, and he is now playing with it. So that is what you are hearing. Hmm, so maybe I'm wrong. Because Rachel is mad at Franklin because he did hire the cop. The more adept cop. Who was actually making progress and figured out that she was the one responsible for it at the time and being missing. So I don't know, what's y'all's opinion of Franklin? He just left quite dramatically, saying that he is going to the devil, upset that Rachel won't see him and is quite mad at him. So do y'all think he's part of the problem or is he actually a good guy? I, I keep wavering. We have a footnote. Ms. Rachel's so upset she doesn't want to go back to the house before they proceed to London, her and her mother. So it better just to remain in the country until further ordered to look after things. And the servants left with me were to be put on board wages. And board wages are much reduced wages for servants maintaining properties unoccupied by the owners. Makes sense. I guess they wouldn't have as much work to do with the family not being at home. Better has just found himself face to face with the fisherman's daughter, y Yolanda. Uh, limping a Lucy and we have a little note said baiting her lame foot and her leanness and baiting means except for so except for her lame lame foot and leanness the girl had some pleasing qualities I guess that's a term that has gone out of fashion nobody uses baiting anymore she's accusing mr. Franklin of murder <coughs> His response to her was poo. Okay, that cracked me up. <laughs> she was so surprised by it that her temper flared out directly. Flamed out directly. Yeah, she's blaming him for Rosanna's death. Ooh, Lucy is mad. So apparently the letter that Rosanna sent the roundabout way finally arrived at uh, Lucy's house, the Yoda, Yolanders. There we go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she makes it quite clear in her letter that she took her own life because, she, because of Mr. Franklin. She was heartbroken, never even looked at her. So again, I still think it's, I don't know that I buy this surface story. I, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem a proportionate response her infatuation with him I think there's something being left out which I curious to find out I really want to know I, I still don't think she's dead <laughs> oh there's another letter to Franklin so he has to return if he wants a letter he needs to go return that and get that because I want to know what it says okay when Mr. Franklin was talking to his father, Mr. Blake, and Mr. Blake said he didn't have time to talk to him. He could hear him later. He can listen at the end of the session. There's a note. 
and that is referring to Parliament's annual session ran from January or February to August. Whoa! So he's not going to listen to him until August? Man, that's pretty jacked up. <laughs> Good for Franklin. So he's leaving. When asked if his father should be told, he said, yes, tell him at the end of session. Good for him. I don't blame him. Went to his dad for a problem. And so I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you months from now. I don't know what month they're in when this, but uh, I just, wait, this means that we're not going to find out what's in that letter for a long time because he's left the country and Lucy will only give it to him if he appears in person. It's not right. Okay, there's a note talking about uh, a doctor had been consulted for Miss Rachel and had earned a guinea. And a guinea is a gold coin valued at one pound and one shilling. I don't know how much a shilling is, but that's what a guinea is worth. Okay, so a betterage is his portion is completed. I'm, I'm going to miss him. I loved him. So much fun. I hope the other narratives will be half as good as he is. And I do like how he laid out that he was only permitted to discuss what he witnessed and saw personally himself. So laying it out for the, the story to be passed off to our other first-hand sources. So hopefully the mystery will pick up because... Up to this point, it's almost feeling more like a period drama with a lot of comedy in it, granted, than it is an actual mystery because there's really not much of an investigation. Cuff just kind of came in and said this, this, this without any, you know, or there's nothing to speculate about because it's just being laid out. So hopefully that will change during the second half of the book. But let's find out. Because now we have Miss Clark. Oh, so it's going to be the, she's the niece of Lady Joya by marriage. Our first footnote is Patmos. And that is a Greek island where Jesus' disciple John is said to have written the New Testament book of Revelation. And we have another one already. So it says, in his retirement at Patmos, Amid the howling ocean of property that surrounds us. Oh, howling ocean of popery. And that's a derogatory term for Roman Catholicism. Referring to the head of the Catholic Church. Pretty apparent that Miss Clark's going to be... Yeah, she's not going to be a very likable character. I already don't like her and I think we're only four paragraphs in. <laughs> okay, we already have another note. It says, my diary informs me that I was accidentally... Passing Aunt Verdner's house in Montague Square. And Montague Square is a relatively modern area of London, a block from Collins's home when he wrote the Moonstone. Okay, yeah, she's already made a slight against Betteridge, which he warned us would happen. And we have another note already that she's always having a few tracks in her bag. And those are tracks are religious pamphlets, especially popular in the Victorian period. <laughs> okay, I wasn't expecting much humor in this, but the fact that she gave the woman who answered the door a tract, a pamphlet that was titled A Word With You on Your Cap Ribbons. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling we're still going to have some snark and humor coming into this. And how insufferable is this character? Oh my God, I would have dropped kicked her into next week. Okay, there is an actual end note this time for the Select Committee of the Mother's Small Clothes Conservation Society. Oh, Clack. I thought her name was Clark. Anyway, the archetypal self-righteous evangelist is a target for rid of ridicule for Collins. The laughably trivial and indeed unjust work of Clack's favorite society, which punishes men indiscriminately simply for the crime of poverty, Reflects her foolishness and moral insensitivity. So, yeah, she's... It, Collins didn't like this character either, which is good to know. 
Oh, so Godfrey's going to have some connections to her. You remember he has a lot of these charities? <laughs> this character is so ridiculous. <laughs> okay, we have another end note. Um, she is describing how Godfrey Abel White had received a letter from a little boy that was entrusted to him by an old lady and the, no reply was necessary. He said, open the letter for Godfrey Abel White's experience described next in this chapter. Collins drew on a notorious 1861 case in which Major William Murray was lured to an apartment in North Amberlin Street and shot in the head. He escaped from his attacker, William John Roberts, who eventually died of wounds sustained in his struggle with Murray. Various documents related to the case, including the testimony of Murray's mistress, with whom Roberts was in love, appear in the edition of the Moonstone, edited by Steve Farmer. See for further reading. Whoa, okay. So I guess he's going to be referring to a case that, that happened. So then this notorious case was in 1861. And when did this come out? Was it 1868? Yes, so 1868. So seven years after this big case was probably all the buzz in London, we're going to have some references to it. So the, the population would have definitely recognized it. So Godfrey's at this house and all of a sudden uh, somebody grabs him from behind around the neck. He went to meet with whoever the letter writer was. No, wait, I thought everything was supposed to be done. Only things that were witnessed firsthand is how these narratives were going to go. So I missed something. Why is she telling of Godfrey's assault? So, okay, she's just relating. I, I went ahead and backtracked. All she can do is state the facts as they were stated on that Monday evening to me. Proceeding on the plan that we've been, okay. So, since she keeps a daily diary, I guess this would be as close as we have to a first-hand account. Which means... Is Godfrey going to be murdered? And that's why we can't get a first-hand account from him. Are they actually going to kill him? Because he, he was definitely roughed up. And they're searching him for the, the diamond, obviously. And him and Lurker were both at the bank at the same time. Okay. So now I know that she is, in fact, given a second-hand account. From what she was told. Again, we're hearing that the same thing happened to Mr. Lurker. Lured out by a letter. And it looks like our three Indians are involved in this. They are obviously searching for the yellow diamond. But why isn't Lurker telling us himself? Okay, she definitely referenced a murder. So a murder is going to happen. I, I don't, I don't know. I would assume it has to be Abel White or Lurker because we're not getting their, this from their first-hand account. I don't know. Little Miss Clack, is that her name? She's definitely jealous of Rachel. Mr. Abel Weiss' attention to her. She's getting quite catty. Miss Rachel is definitely interested in finding out what the receipt was that was stolen from Lurker. I think she wants to find out if it was the one for the yellow diamond. There was a footnote. So Rachel's flipping out and her mother rose from the chair and then she pointed to one of the little vials in her work box. She says, quick, six drops in water. Don't let Rachel see. And six drops is ether or amyl nitrate, first used in England to relieve angina chest pains in the 1860s. I guess they're going to give her a sedative. They're going to calm her down. 
because the doctor said that she needs to engage her mind elsewhere. Um, she actually told Clyde to get the jug of water. Oh, I guess she's flipping out because of the damage to his reputation. The fact that he would hawk something or hide the diamond. She's maintaining that, that Godfrey was not the one who took the diamond. Oh, wait. Lady Julia is the one who's drinking the drugged water. I thought it was going to be given to Rachel. Oh. Is she afraid she's going to have a heart attack? Is that like nitroglycerin? Is that the equivalent? Oh, yeah. So I guess she was having chest pain. I completely missed that. <laughs> Talking about Lady Julia. Rachel just is exhausting. <laughs> she just left to go to the flower show with her friends. Like she doesn't have a care in the world. Dun, dun, dun. So, Mr. Bruff, who we know from our next magical paragraph, is going to be coming to the house to work up Lady Julia's will. And it looks like she's got a heart condition. So, it's definitely gotten a lot more dramatic, especially when Rachel's around. She's that girl. She's just... Yeah, I, I still don't like her. And... Abel White, he kind of redeemed himself for me because I really expected, based on how he was earlier, or at least portrayed, I expected him to really milk the being accosted and bound and gagged. But he really doesn't want the attention from that. And he seems genuinely concerned for Rachel. And he burned up the piece of paper, you know, where she declared him innocent. So, he, he's been redeemed a little in my eyes. He seems to genuinely care for her. We will see what Clack has to reveal, though, because something else is... She said that she couldn't just leave it at that. There was more to the, to the story. Painful disclosures still to make in regards to her... Clearly, her hero, Mr. Abelwife. Talk about a girl who's gone beyond hero worship. All right, I took a little break, but I'm back, and hopefully I will be able to finish our stop tonight. It's like 10 o'clock now. The contractor never showed. No phone call, no text, nothing. Guess who I won't be hiring if he does decide to show up on Monday. So rude. Oh, jeez, poor Lady Julia. She just told uh, Drusella Clark, Clack, whatever her name is, you know, that she doesn't have much longer to live. And Miss Clack is just beside herself thinking how fortunate that she's there to help ease her, her passing. And she's excited for her to move on to the next phase in her life or however she put it. And it's just, now she's going to give her books to read. This, uh, yeah, uh, I would not want all that self-righteous around me if the, yeah I, I just no thank you <laughs> okay so miss clack is talking to the lawyer while they're waiting to go and see lady julia about the will and uh he's sharing public opinion on abel white and mr lurker and you know what he has to say makes a lot more sense than abel white just being kidnapped and searched simply based on the fact that he was exiting the bank at the same time as Mr. Lurker. So apparently it looks like those two had talked and, you know, the Indians are, they seem to be pretty spot on when they're following somebody or when they suspect somebody to have the diamond. It seems like they're very purposeful with the actions that they're taking. So I would bet that there was something linking Abel White to Lurker and the Yellow Diamond, other than just the these flimsy little coincidences. 
So apparently Rachel confided in her mom that she was ready to marry Franklin before all of this happened. Okay, so he's saying that we know Rachel, Franklin, and Abelweiss are all innocent. <laughs> so, of stealing the diamond. And that's what's baffling everybody because they can't figure it out. Because they're saying that and then they're just as equally sure that somebody brought the moonstone to London. Mr. Lurker or his banker is in possession of it. But they can't figure this out. Except for Cuff. <laughs> oh, jeez. Miss Clack's book that she's given her, The Serpent at Home. Chapters best adapted to female perusal are Satan in the Hairbrush, Satan Behind the Looking Glass, Satan Under the Tea Table, Satan Out of the Window. <laughs> Oh, she's just ridiculous. Although, I'll give her this. She is passionate about it. Uh-oh. We have a little visitor. So she's leaving her books everywhere. Hoping that Lady Julia will read one. And I guess I will say this for her. She really does think she's helping. So it could be worse. Oh. I'm sure it's tiring dealing with her. Actually, I feel kind of bad for Miss Clack that her books were returned on doctor's orders. She was so happy that she was able to leave them for her aunt. And you know, she doesn't want any, she, she doesn't want anything from her. She wasn't upset that she wasn't included in the will or anything like that. So uh, as insufferable as she can be, she's honestly quite, um, She's a little endearing just in her, she seems pure of heart, other than maybe being a little too over the top, but she doesn't seem to have any ulterior motives or anything. So what harm would it have done to leave those pamphlets in the house and let her think that they were being read? I think that was kind of cruel to send them back to her, unless maybe they were just afraid to encourage her that it would, you know, get out of hand but still I think it was kind of cruel Finley was crying in the other room I think he's lonely there's Finley he really is a cuddle bug and I haven't seen him much since Jack joined the downstairs yeah are you happy <laughs> it was a low Finley <laughs> so, she's a determined little thing. <laughs> she just got her friends to help her write her letters with all of extracts from the books for her aunt. So, persistent, I'll give her that. <laughs> so, that little jolt that you had was Jack bumping into the ring light. Yeah, he's trying to get Finley to play. So Mr. Abel White is back and he's going to do something. He's going to meet with Lady Julia. Dun, dun, dun. Rachel's going on and on with Godfrey about, you know, her hypothetical situation. When she's saying, suppose you're not in love with me. Suppose you're in love with someone else. And she goes on and on. I just don't like Rachel. I, d I don't like anything about her. She's so dramatic in everything. And so wishy-washy. I mean, I'm assuming she's talking about Franklin. That she loves him, but she won't. She will never be with him. Never see him again. Yeah, no, she's beating her hands wildly on the back of the ottoman. Bursts out crying. You know, I got some stairs she can fling herself on. Go, oh. <laughs> oh, she's so over the top. And this segment is really dragging out. While Clack is, you know, so over the top and hilarious just in that alone. It's like, can we just get back to the original, you know, the mystery? I, I don't need to read all of this about the society and 
we get it. Clack is very zealous in her beliefs. And, and while it is funny, her hiding the books and everything around, it, it's like, come on, let's just get back to the original. And I know this, the magazines, they, they wanted that word count. So it would be inflated and I'm feeling it. Oh, ah. is anybody else getting impatient with it? It's not to say I'm not enjoying it, but there's times where it's like, come on, let's advance our plot. <laughs> I like how she responded to Godfrey's proposal. She's, Godfrey, you must be mad. Talking, of course, about Rachel. At least Rachel has some sense and she's continuing to refuse Godfrey's proposal even though he's saying she basically doesn't have to love him. <laughs> he's okay with just having her respect and affection. Yeah, her regard. Oh, and then she just accepted him. <laughs> so I take it back. It didn't take her long to to cave. Oh, Lady Julia just died. So I wonder, did Abel White know of Lady Julia's illness? And was that why he was so insistent that Rachel agreed to marry him? Is he after the her money? Because I assume she's going to inherit everything. So, and apparently he doesn't think too much of the societies that he leads. And poor Miss Clack had to hear him speak so flippantly about her and the, the work that she does and the other girls, the other ladies of the society that had to have hurt her feelings. So I, I do give her credit for keeping her mouth shut and not saying anything. Not coming out and calling them on it. <laughs> so, since Lady Julia didn't get to read her extracts, she's sending them on to Mr. Franklin. That's actually kind of cute. Oh, but he returned them to her. I guess maybe one of the reasons why, you know, everybody keeps sending them back because. I would assume if you encourage her even just a tiny bit, she's just going to run with it and be like a dog that won't let go of a bone. <laughs> okay, that was, that was cute. The back and forth with the extracts. I, I do like that. And, you know, finally he just realized if she's going to keep sending them. So he went ahead and kept them. I doubt he ever read them though. I bet Betteridge was just devastated when Lady Julia died. You could tell he really held her in high regard and she was special to him. I bet he was just heartbroken. Okay, they're figuring out where Miss Rachel should live. And we have a little footnote, first one in a while. And they're talking about furnishing a house for her in Brighton. And Brighton is a popular seaside resort on the English Channel, about 50 miles south of London. Good to know. I've heard of it, but I never knew exactly where it was. I'll admit, I'm, I'm ready to move past Miss uh, Clark. Clark? <laughs> Clack. There we go, Miss Clack, and get on to the next narrator. I, I just find her segment to be really drawn out. We do have a footnote. It's uh, one of them, a clerical friend, kindly helped me to take sittings for our little party in the church. And that means it was to reserve a pew in the church. So they wanted to have a row of seats, which I wonder if they'll even use. Oh, so something happened. Uh, Rachel isn't going to marry Mr. Abel White. I wonder if she heard something about Mr. Franklin from the lawyer. 
Miss Clack is trying to find out. She's trying to weasel it out of Rachel, but so far she's not being very forthcoming. Oh, the one with the cap ribbons that she gave the pamphlet to at the very beginning was um, Penelope. No, that's too funny. I didn't realize it was her. I forgot that she was Miss Rachel's maid. Well, apparently the engagement is off. I guess we're probably going to have to wait until we get to Broth's narrative to find out why. That would be my guess. So if it's to be believed, Abel White isn't upset that Rachel broke off the engagement because he, he was kind of thinking they should break it off anyway because he knows that she's in love with someone else. So I don't know that I buy it. I think he would have been perfectly fine to have the wealth and the standing by being married to her, but maybe I'm wrong. I still don't like him. I still get a sleazy vibe from him. But I think that Rachel learned something, and that's what caused her to break off the engagement, not just that she knows she doesn't love him. <laughs> you gotta love how Miss Clack got up and started reading from a book when Mr. Abel White was just railing on Rachel for breaking the engagement. So <laughs> it just cracked me up. And I keep picturing Mary from Pride and Prejudice when I read her, you know, reading from her book of sermons. So, yeah, that, that was pretty good. <laughs> She's got a tract on profane swearing. Hush, for heaven's sake. Okay, they're arguing over who rented the beach house or the Brighton house. Uh, Miss Rachel and Mr. Ablewife. And a breath is being consulted. He said, you appear to forget, he said, addressing Mr. Ablewhite, that you took this house as Miss Verdner's guardian for Miss Verdner's use. And there's a an, uh, footnote there that women in this period reached their majority at 21 at the earliest, and Rachel is 18. So she couldn't have rented a house on her own. So he rented it on her behalf. So technically it is her house. Oh, he's like, he's not going to marry my son. I'm not going to be her guardian. And that position was offered by the, came about through the will, and he's just not going to uphold it. It's pretty petty. All right, it's the next morning, and I'm going to be reading at my desk today. Family is asleep in my rocking chair, and I don't want to risk upsetting the apple cart. All of the cats are calm and quiet. If I move him, it, it just may set off a chain reaction. So we're just going to leave it as is. So we're switching narrators, and now we've got Matthew Bruff, the solicitor of Lady Julia. And we're starting out with a footnote right away. For Gray's Inn, and it's one of the four inns of court, Gray's Inn house law offices. And inn is capitalized, by the way. So I wonder how his tone is going to differ from Betteridge and Miss Clack. I would assume he's going to be more straightforward, you know, the legal, the legal mind. We'll see if he is. All right. Getting close. Yeah, so we're going to find out why Rachel called off the engagement. I figured there was more to it. Apparently, he's going to give us all the dirt. <laughs> Cracks me up. Sir John doing his will. He wants to go back to sleep. He leaves everything to his wife. Done. <laughs> Draw the papers. I'll sign. Okay, when talking about Lady Julia's will, we have another footnote, and it says, The will was placed in the hands of my proctor to be proved. As the phrase is in the usual way and a proctor is an official dedicated to manage affairs in court proved is the other one and that's to establish the authenticity of a legal document especially a will so I would assume like probate going to probate court we're getting it ready for probate when Brof is talking to his friend in the proctor's office says, I have some great news for you. What do you think I heard at Doctor's Commons this morning? And we have a footnote. 
that is a colloquial name for the College of Advocates and Doctors of Law, where wills and marriage license were stored. Oh, and it was that Lady Verander's will had been asked for and examined already. And she wasn't, I guess this was shortly, yeah, three weeks after uh, they redid it. So Mr. Smalley, of the firm of Skip and Smalley, asked for it. Hmm. No, that's a new name for us. Wow. So even though he shouldn't have, you know, press to find out the name of who the client was for Mr. Smalley, he did, even though, you know, client privilege and all that. And it was Godfrey Abel White. He's the one who wanted to know about Lady Julia's will. Which I suspected that's probably why he proposed. Okay, so we do get a little bit more insight into Rachel's thinking while she's talking to Bruff about ending her engagement with Godfrey. And that's that she didn't necessarily talk anything over with anybody. She didn't hash it out with someone, get outside opinions. She just withdrew into herself for a while while they were walking and came to her own conclusions by her own counsel. And even though he was giving her an out on a way to end the engagement, she was like, well, I, I can't say he's despicable because I agreed to marry him in the first place. So that would make me. So she's got her, her standards and her morals that she's not willing to cross. And she's just going to say that I've thought it over and this isn't a good idea anymore without giving that reasoning. So she won't have to contradict herself, I guess. So, and I think the significance of that is her reasoning would be the same with the moonstone for whatever reason that she has misplaced it or that she was going to sell it, fence it to raise some money. She, there is some underlying reason behind that, but she's not going to confide in anybody. She doesn't care what society is going to speculate about her, that she's got her reasons and that's good enough. She came to those conclusions on her own and it's nobody else's business but her own. So I, I think there's definitely, she was trying to raise this money for somebody else and I'm still wondering if it was Franklin. I thought maybe it was Godfrey, but the, the more we see of him and obviously he was hoping for a lump sum of money because looks like once he realized they couldn't sell the property or the land that he couldn't get his hands on a bunch of cash quick, he wasn't that upset with the wedding being called off anyway. So, all right, back to it. Oh, this, yeah, Breath has had quite the connection to the Moonstone. He's been there at every step of the way since it came into Colonel Hardencastle's possession. He was even the one getting the letters from the Colonel saying, I'm still alive. <laughs> so yeah, he would, he would have a curiosity. It was like, okay, what, what happened to it? Where is it? Also backtracking just a tiny bit, Godfrey needing that lump sum of money, I would say would indicate that he doesn't have anything to do with the diamond. Cause if he did, he could have sent it off to Amsterdam, have it broken into smaller gems. There's his money, no problem. So I'd say he's probably taken out of it. I don't think he's the reason why Rachel did whatever she did with the diamond. Could be wrong, but it, it doesn't look that way at this point. So I wonder with the Indian going to a breath to get a loan, you know, and offering up his collateral. I wonder if actually what he wanted was to know how long people have to pay back a loan. Was that his indirect route? Was that an indirect route of getting information that he needed without tipping his hand? Because that's kind of how it seems to me. Oh, <laughs> and I'm wrong going to the, I keep calling him Brom. Was his face came to the same conclusion I did on the top of page 301. Okay, so apparently 
the Indian also went to Lurker first, actually. Asked him the same question, how long they had to pay back a loan. So, I think, I think the reasoning for this, whoever Rachel is trying to help has an outstanding loan that's huge. And it, there, so there's an end date. The, the, the stone is going to have to be broken down and intercepted before this end date. Because they're going to have to get cash quick. And seems like he would break it down to get the most cash he can, right? So maybe this is providing the Indians with their, their timeline. And maybe it would make it easier to intercept. I don't know. I think there's something there. I, I may not be on it fully, but anyway, that's my thoughts. And it would be terrifying knowing you were sitting across from the one of the people who was responsible for kidnapping you and whatnot. Wait, what? I think I think I missed something. I think my brain checked out for a minute because all of a sudden the the next week news we hear of him is murder and I, be, I better double track who are we talking about <laughs> my mind still wanders through this is anybody else still fighting that oh okay yeah so it's just that mirth weight is going to resume his travels and it's got society buzzing again on all of the untold dangers he may encounter in his foreign travels and he of course was the one who did the translations at the beginning with the Indians first arrived at Lady Julia's house uh, for Rachel's birthday party. Oh, I just meet, reached our magical paragraph. I am enjoying it. It's slow going for me. I don't know if that's just all the insanity that's been happening. But it's, I feel like it could be edited down. <laughs> oh, man. Again, this was serialized. They, they, they liked to extend those. Um, I don't... <coughs> Cat and knock something off. Again, I don't think I would qualify this as a mystery. I think this is reading more as a historical fiction. Because the Moonstone is such a small subplot. It seems like it's more like a period drama. I, I don't know. At least that's my opinion right now. Um, I am looking forward to continuing though. So there is that. And speaking of that, we need our next stop. So for our next one, we're going 83% of the way into the book. This is going to be within the third narrative. Who is Franklin Blake? And it'll be towards the end of chapter 10, which is the last one in this narrative. When you reach all that you have explained to me, I said, I understand perfectly. When you reach that point, close your book, because that will be the end of our fourth stop. And then I challenge you to wait at least 24 hours before picking up your book or until the next video comes out. But if you're coming to this later, give yourself a break in between. Might give you some more information or it just might be a break that allows you to come back into the story refreshed. But I am enjoying it. I kind of wish the Moonstone was a bigger part of it though. But maybe that will happen as we get deeper into it. I would assume, right? Because it's titled The Moonstone. But that seems a very small portion of the story at this point. So I think I'm just repeating myself. I am going to go get this edited. I look forward to reading our fourth stop with y'all next time. And I can't wait to hear what you thought of Little Miss Clack. Because she... I found her insufferable, but yet, at the same time, she was quite the original character. So, she started to grow on me. We'll see if y'all agreed. Okay, bye.